Well, hey, everybody, welcome to Online Church at White Flag. This is certainly getting to be pretty strange feeling to communicate with you only via technology over so many weeks. I mean, I think we've all experienced having a, a weekend off or a weather situation where you miss church. But man, this is definitely starting to push the limits of, of, of what I'm comfortable with. I, I know there's a lot of things to be afraid of. I know there are a lot of things to you know be worried about right now. Uh, but I'm actually encouraged by the reminder that I have received through this whole process that there's such a value to the church body coming together on a weekly basis. And this, this gap, this time away, you know, it, it, it's showing me that I miss you all and I miss seeing you all connect with each other. And just what a blessing it is that we are able to do this normally meet together every week. And, you know, I think that's a good thing to take away from this. You're, you're hearing all kinds of talk and opinions and ideas and things to, you know, worry about and process through. Uh, maybe there's something good right there for you to focus on that uh, it is good to be a part of a church and to be able to connect with one another. And so I can't wait for you guys to be back. And I don't know when that's going to be. And, and I hope you can't wait to be back. And so I want to just welcome anyone that's joining us online for church. Uh, we're in the middle of a series. I say in the middle of it. We just started it last week, but this one's a short one. And I absolutely love this series. What do I love about it? Well, it's a lot of history. It's a lot of context. And I love giving you the word of God and letting it kind of just you know, fall where it may and, and hit you where it hits you. I, I don't like trying to make something more interesting than what's in the Bible. And sometimes that's a trap that preachers can get into. And so I've just been loving this series. It's called Eyes on Jesus. And it's, it's all about how you view Jesus. And the way that we're asking that question and exploring that question is we're investigating the time in Jesus's life between his arrest and the crucifixion. You know, it's just a short period of time, just two days. And, and there were certain people that had eyes on Jesus during those moments. And there were conversations and observations and transformations that, that took place. And, and we can learn a lot from, from looking at these individuals. And so last week we began with Judas. And if you missed that message, I hope that you'll go to our app or our website or any of the other platforms and check out that message. But today we're going to talk about a series of people. In fact, to, to help you kind of keep things straight, uh, I, I kind of put together my own felt board, if you will, but using technology, not really a felt board. But I, I want to go through quickly uh, a group of people that are going to come up in our reading today. And I think by visually being able to see this, and we'll keep this graphic up throughout the message, I think it will help you kind of categorize and build a skeleton for all the facts to fit into. And so the, the first guy that I want to introduce you to is Annas, who is a former high priest, no longer the high priest at the time of Jesus and his crucifixion, but the former one. And uh, I'll explain more about him in a moment. Then we've got Caiaphas, who is the acting high priest. He's actually the one holding office. Then you've got Pilate, who is a Roman governor. And then you've got Herod, who is a ruler of Galilee. All right. So first two guys are, are Jewish leaders and the next two guys are Roman leaders. They've got Roman authority. And, and you might notice that Pilate is on here twice because sequentially, this is what we will see. Jesus having a conversation with Annas, then Caiaphas, Pilate, Herod, and then back to Pilate. So that's just kind of the broad thing now of, of individuals. Now I want to show you a map that will kind of help you put things in place. Now I'm going to say right off the get-go, this map is is pixelated. You're not going to be able to read some of this stuff. And I actually don't want you to read it because uh, I, I wanted to just show you a good kind of 3D view of Jerusalem and, and the temple and, and some of the context of what we talked about last week and where Jesus will be moving throughout uh, our story today. So if you remember last week, I talked to you about uh, Jesus being in an upper room 
and then going to uh, the Garden of Gethsemane where he was betrayed by Judas. Well, let me show you that on the map. First of all, the upper room would have been right about here in one of these uh, dwellings. To get to the Garden of Gethsemane, you just would walk down this hill. This is all downhill, down through the Kidron Valley and up towards the Mount of Olives. Garden of Gethsemane is right here. Uh, what's interesting about today and the different stories we're going to look at, they all take place right here in this neighborhood. So this is the walled city of Jerusalem. This is the temple and the uh, upper room which isn't in our story today, but is right here. And then you're going to see Caiaphas's house. You're going to see uh, Pilate over here. Herod's going to be right here. And then eventually uh, crucifixion moves right over in this direction. So that gives you kind of an idea. What I want you to see is that everything that we're going to talk about today happens in this wealthy upper, it was known as the upper city, Remember, it's downhill to this level and downhill to this level and then way downhill to the valley down here. But this is where it all took place. Just a, a neighborhood, if you will, just a few steps away from each other, all these individuals will encounter Jesus. And so uh, we'll go back to the graphic of the people and we will begin our journey. Now, today, uh, you need to remember that we left off with last week, Jesus was arrested, bound, and he was led off. And he, he was being led somewhere. Well, the first individual is going to be Annas. Now, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my best. It's not easy. You got to remember, there's four Gospels. They all tell the story differently. None of them match up perfectly because they're all, you know, being uh, told by different people. But there's no contradiction. You just got to kind of fill in and put pieces together and understand how it all flows together. And that's what I'm going to try to do uh, for you today. Annas is only talked about in the Gospel of John. He's not even mentioned in any of the others. And John doesn't give us any details about anything about Annas. The, the thing I want you to be aware of is from the moment he's arrested, it says that's where he goes. He goes to the house of Annas, who was the former high priest. And this conversation isn't recorded in any of the Gospels. We don't know what goes down there. Um, what we think, experts think, is that, you know, even though Annas was no longer holding office, he was still a person of clout. And uh, people deferred to him. Um, it'd be kind of like if our president would run for, you know, uh, a full eight years, he, he can't be president anymore. Can you imagine if he stuck around and still had influence and he could still make decisions? Well, that's what was going on with Annas. He wasn't official, but he was respected. And so they brought Jesus there for like a preliminary investigation. But that's all we know. And then immediately they go to the second stop. And this is where we're going to spend some time. The second stop is to the house of Caiaphas. Caiaphas is the acting high priest. He does hold office. One little side note, he is the son-in-law of Annas. So it kind of runs in the family. And Caiaphas, Caiaphas has a plan. And the plan includes one thing, killing Jesus. Caiaphas wants to eliminate Jesus. And uh, I want you to understand that everybody involved in this conversation that we're about to look at is on the same page. They all know that they're going to trump up charges. It's not going to be a real trial. Remember, this is the middle of the night. They're doing it all by the cover of darkness. They've decided who's going to be in the courtroom, if you will. Uh, Caiaphas is the, the head of priest, right? He's the, he's the high priest. There's uh, like a, a supreme court of Jewish leaders and he's in charge. He's got all these uh, elders and Pharisees and Sadducees and Jewish leaders together and they decide, let's just make up some accusations, get some people to agree on making those accusations and we'll have Jesus right where we want him. Here's the problem. Even though they set it all up, they can't get anybody to agree why is it important for them to agree? Because by their laws, they got to have two witnesses in agreement. And so while they're making things up to hurl, you know, uh, you know, false accusations at Jesus, 
They can't even get two people to agree. In fact, the scripture says, finally, after a long time, finally, two people came forward with the same story. And what was that story? Well, the story went like this. The guy steps forward and says, this fellow, and he's referring to Jesus, he says, and I quote, this fellow claimed I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. That was the accusation, that Jesus said this. Now, did Jesus say something close to that? Yes, but they got the details wrong. Uh, the allegation was a little bit true, but, but not all the way. Uh, you may remember way back at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, you ever heard the story where, where Jesus goes into the temple and he sees that they're selling things, it's like a marketplace, and he flips over the tables because he's angry? Well, in that moment, um, you know, everybody looked at Jesus like, who's this guy? And they literally said to Jesus, nobody knew who he was, they're like, what gives you the right to flip tables and yell at us and say, this is my father's house and you're making it into a market? Like, what authority? You need to prove through some kind of a sign or, or, or something that we should listen to you. Otherwise, you know, get out of here. And Jesus' response to that was, and I quote, destroy this temple. Like, if you destroy this temple, not I'm going to destroy this temple, but you destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. In which everybody was like, what? It took us 46 years to build it. And you think you're going to rebuild it? Now, they're focused on the temple. Jesus wasn't even talking about the temple as a building. He was actually kind of foreshadowing and speaking in code about his body. That, that, that if you want to come at me, you know, I might die, but on, on the third day I will rise. But they didn't get that. And they were a little bit confused at this point, so they bring that up. Two guys that may have heard him say something close, but they're like, yeah, he said he was going to destroy the temple and, and, and that he could rebuild it like he's God or something. And that's all that Caiaphas needed. Caiaphas had two people who were, you know, accusing Jesus of making this claim. And so Caiaphas says, well, Jesus, are you going to answer? What's your answer to this charge? But Jesus remain silent. Now, you, you'll see that a lot in, in this journey through all these conversations when you read the Gospels, but I want you to understand something. When it says Jesus remains silent, it's not like Jesus doesn't talk throughout this uh, series of trials. He talks a lot. It's just he's silent when somebody lies about him, when somebody hits him, when somebody accuses him of something. He is silent. But that doesn't mean he doesn't say some pretty interesting things. So in this case, Caiaphas says, are you, are, are you not going to uh, answer this charge? Jesus is silent. So Caiaphas says, well, then I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you're the Messiah, the son of God. So now he's like laid it out. So there's no confusion. And Jesus responded. He says, well, you have said so. That's what you're saying. As you have said it, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on clouds of heaven. Now, let me just tell you, that's a pretty bold statement. Again, Jesus isn't silent when it comes to saying who he is. He's just silent at trying to respond to all the accusations because he's not trying to get out of something. And so here with this bold response, that, that was it. Caiaphas, he starts ripping his garments. He's, he, this is what, what they do when they're outraged, when they're grieving. In his mind, he cannot believe that Jesus would say this in front of witnesses. And he feels, Caiaphas feels, like he's defending God. And so with that, he says in a loud voice, Jesus has spoken blasphemy. We don't need any more witnesses. And that was it. The kangaroo court that they had thrown together started shouting, he is worthy of death. And they began, and I say they, the Jewish 
leaders began to spit in the face of Jesus. They struck him with their fists. They slapped him in the face and they mocked him. And this would just be the beginning of some unspeakable abuse that Jesus would endure over the next several hours. And so at this point, uh, they, they are at early morning, right? They, they grabbed him that night. They went through the cover of darkness. They have sorted this all out. It's early in the morning, and now they have formalized everything that went on by cover of darkness. They got things like, you know, a sham trial on paper so it looks official. They bound Jesus, and they led him out. Now, where are they going? Well, the next stop, the third stop, is Pilate, the Roman governor. Why in the world would the Jewish leaders who have authority over their people and who are like the Supreme Court, the the highest in command, why would they need to take Jesus to a Roman governor, right? I mean, they, they, they found him guilty. They, they are ready to execute him, but they go to Pontius Pilate's palace. Well, because Jewish leaders, and they knew this, they could not carry out a capital punishment. They couldn't execute anyone without the okay from Rome. And so they have to go to Pilate's house. They have to take their case and present it to Pilate. And so it's clear from the beginning when they show up to Pilate's place that that Pilate doesn't want to have anything to do with Jesus, anything to do with these Jews. He doesn't want to have anything to do with the whole trial at all. And so he's constantly looking for a way out. But the Jewish leaders, they're ready, right? They're they're ready to, to give their case to Pilate. And what's so interesting is now when they're about to level their accusations against Jesus to Pilate, it changes from a Jewish accusation to almost a Roman accusation. Why? Why why would that be the case? Well, because they need Rome to agree with their death sentence. So listen to how uh, scripture tells us that the Jewish leaders presented this to Pilate. They said, here's the problem with Jesus. Here's what he's guilty of. Number one, subverting our nation. And they weren't talking about the Jewish nation. They were talking about Rome. Now they're going to play like they're real big fans of Rome. They'll even later say, yeah, go Caesar. We're all about Caesar, right? When they're not, they're just lying. And so they present it to Pilate like, listen, Jesus is a problem because he's subverting Rome, which wasn't true. The second accusation was he's against paying taxes to Caesar, which was an outright lie. Jesus had actually taught you should give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but they were making up lies trying to get a certain outcome. The third Uh, accusation is actually true. The third accusation was he claims to be Messiah, King. Now they were using though this phrase in a very, uh, you know, edgy way because they knew this would be the one. If the other ones didn't bother the authorities of Rome, they knew that, you you know, Caesar was the only King. He was the only Messiah. And so this would help any Roman official come to their side. And so Pilate listens to all of this and he says, you know what? I don't, I don't like this. I, I don't like, this smells fishy. And, and Pilate's, you know, he's no dummy. Um, he decides to bring Jesus in to his palace. Again, this is not really speculation. It says in scripture, so he summoned Jesus into the palace. And when Jesus comes in, they have a deep conversation. And, and I just want to uh, read to you the conversation. But first, let me, let me begin with the question that Pilate starts off with. Brings Jesus in, he says, well, so are you the king of the Jews? And this is uh, the response in the conversation. In John chapter 18, verses 34 through 38, 
it will appear on, on the TV next to me here. Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? So, so Pilate began with a question, are, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, well, are you asking that question because you're wondering that? Or did someone tell you that I said that? Like, what's going on here? Pilate replied, am I a Jew? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? In other words, like, what did you do to tick these guys off? Well, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. So, so Jesus, again, Jesus isn't silent. He's got a lot to say. He's just silent when somebody's lying about him, punching him, beating him, accusing him of something. He's silent. But here he's saying some pretty deep things about how, how he has authority, but he's holding back right now and that his kingdom is somewhere else, but it's about to take over. So uh, then Pilate says, oh, so then you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. But in fact, the reason I was born and I came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Now again, I mean, I, I love it when we get to see the strong side of Jesus. The one that's not so timid and walking around like, you know, he's on a cloud. You know, the pictures are he's walking around on clouds with rainbows coming out of his, you know, out of his sleeves or something. But, but Jesus is strong and he's not intimidated. And so he throws that back to Pilate. And Pilate's response to that is, what is truth? As if, you know, truth can move around and everybody has their own truth. And so this interesting conversation that's just getting started uh, comes to an end. And, and Pilate, he knows something is up. He's had this conversation with Jesus. He sees that Jesus isn't some rebel rouser. He's not a problem. He, he's not dangerous. And so uh, he, 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 it says in scripture, and I'll quote this, just so you know that I'm not like speculating for Pilate. It says, for he knew it was out of self-interest that the Jewish leaders had handed Jesus over to him. So Pilate knows what's going down. He may not know all the details, but he knows that Jesus isn't guilty of anything. And at some point in this process, again, this is piecing together all of the gospel accounts, Somewhere along the line, he figures out that Jesus is from Galilee. Why is that important? Because he sees this as a way of out of making a decision, out of being involved with all this Jewish drama. He knows who the leader of the area of Galilee is. And that leader just happens to be in town just like he is. By the way, neither of them live in this area. They just are both here. These Roman leaders are here because it's the time of festivals. It's the Passover and it, there's a huge influx because this is where the temple is and everybody comes here and they need to keep their cities under control so their authorities don't get angry at them. And so Pilate goes, huh, you're from Galilee. Herod rules over Galilee and he's just around the corner. And so that leads us to the fourth stage. We started at Annas. We moved to Caiaphas. Caiaphas takes Jesus to Pilate. Now, Pilate wants to send Jesus to Herod. And so, Herod. Who is this Herod? There are a lot of Herods in the Bible. This is Herod Antipas. If you're looking for a, a great name, you know, to name your kids. Herod Antipas. This is where Jesus is taken next. Now, what's interesting about Herod Antipas is there is a backstory and a back connection between him and Jesus. And, and maybe you've never put this together because there's so many Herods and you just get confused and you start going, ah, I don't know which Herod is what. So, so let me just give you a little background. First of all, you've heard of Herod the Great probably. Um, Herod the Great was who was ruling 
during the time of Jesus's birth. So you remember the story where, where Herod gets nervous and decides to kill all the baby boys who are like two and under in the region? That is Herod Antipas's father. Okay, that's Herod the Great. Well, once he dies, he's got a bunch of kids. He's got four kids. He splits things up. Things change a little bit. But, but Herod Antipas comes on the scene first during the time of John the Baptist. So do you remember the story about John the Baptist having his head chopped off? Well, that was done by this guy, Herod Antipas. Well, that makes him connected to Jesus because John was the forerunner uh, to Jesus. Jesus was baptized by John. They were friends, right? Jesus says there's no better person to ever walk the earth than John the Baptist. Pretty high praise. So there's definitely a connection there. So Jesus definitely has a connection to the guy who has, you know, chopped off the head of his close friend. Well, there's another connection. When Herod killed John the Baptist. Once he started hearing about Jesus and that Jesus was doing miracles, Herod was convinced that John the Baptist had risen from the dead or was like reincarnated, uh, that Jesus was actually John the Baptist because he was doing miracles. And so he was convinced, so convinced that then he sent the word out that he wanted to kill Jesus, even though he had no beef with Jesus. He wanted to kill Jesus because he thought Jesus was actually John the Baptist. I know that sounds crazy, but actually word gets to Jesus. You can read about this in John. I think it's in John chapter two. Word gets to Jesus by uh, the Pharisees. They're actually uh, now I'm thinking it might not be John chapter two. I don't know what, where that is, but trust me, it's in there. Um, word gets to Jesus. You need to get out of here. We don't want you here. And by the way, Herod wants to kill you. And what I love is Jesus's response to this guy. Remember, they haven't met yet. And remember, in our context, they're about to meet. This is all way back in the day, right? When, when he finds out Herod wants to kill him, Jesus says, you tell that fox. Now just think about that. He is the ruler of Galilee. You tell that fox that I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing today. I'm going to do it tomorrow. And I'm going to do it the next day. And on the third day, I'm going to complete my work. That's not a paraphrase. That's actually what he says. He said, you tell him, you tell that fox, if he's looking for me, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing because I'm on a mission and my mission will not be messed with. Because again, here we have Jesus kind of prophetically talking about how he is going to die and rise on the third day. So I just, again, love that. That's tough Jesus. That's manly Jesus, which I think Jesus was all the time, not rainbow Jesus. But anyway, here we have this backstory and Jesus is about to walk right before him. That makes it even more interesting to me. But, there's not a lot of information about this conversation. In fact, only in Luke do we have any mention that Jesus goes before Herod, that Pilate sends Jesus over to Herod. And so it's short enough that just reading it will be the quickest way for me to get you this information. So this is found in Luke 23, verses 8 and 9. It says, When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased. That should get your attention. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. This goes all the way back to when he thought he was John the Baptist uh, because Jesus was doing miracles. The miracles is what got his attention. It says, from what he had heard about Jesus, he had hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort or a miracle. So he he, he plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. Here we see, once again, Jesus was silent. But only silent uh, about this conversation with Herod. What were the questions that Herod was asking him? Uh, well, we know what type of person Herod was. You know, he takes his brother's wife. Uh, you know, uh, he, he, he likes a dancing girl. Uh, and, you know, 
that he's related to. And when she says, I want the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter, he chops the head off of John the Baptist. So we've got an impulsive guy who does what he wants and he doesn't get his questions answered. He was probably asking the wrong questions because we see that Jesus is ready to talk, but he's not going to defend himself against accusations. He's not trying to get out of this whole judgment and trial scenario because Jesus is on a mission. And so what we see in Luke is that Herod gets frustrated. He's not getting the miracles and he's not getting the answer to his questions. And so Herod says, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm not interested anymore. And he sends him back to Pilate. Step five or stage five or scenario five. So now we see that he is back in front of Pilate. And it's at this point that Pilate realizes, man, you know, he's got to deal with this situation. And the situation is getting bigger and bigger because a crowd has been growing, right? There was a crowd that brought him, a mob to Annas. More people were waiting at Caiaphas's house for the false, you know, sham trial. Then, you know, word gets out. You might remember here, Peter was hanging out, listening the whole time and watching from a distance while he warmed himself by the fire. Uh, and then they went to Pilate. All of this is building momentum. More people are coming around. And so Pilate, who doesn't want to have to deal with this situation, starts to think, you know what? I need to appeal to this growing crowd that has gathered. And it was customary uh, during the festival for the Romans to release one prisoner. So he's thinking, hey, I got an idea. I can release a prisoner. And I don't think Jesus is guilty of anything. And I don't have a problem with Jesus. And so you know, just a couple of days ago, the city was in an uproar. You know, they were waving the palm branches and they were celebrating Jesus. So he seems to be pretty popular. Maybe I can put it to the crowd and the crowd can decide to release Jesus. I'll give him a choice. Surely I'll, I'll make it even easier. I'll, I'll pick Barabbas, which I don't have time to get into, but guess what Barabbas's name was? Jesus. That's a real mind bender. Both of their names were Jesus. He puts two Jesuses up there, Jesus Barabbas and Jesus Christ, and says, look, you pick, assuming that they would pick Jesus who never hurt anybody and just helped people. And everybody knew that Jesus Barabbas was a terrible guy. But it doesn't go down the way Pilate thought it would go down. You see, while he is starting to present this to the crowd, the Jewish leaders are moving throughout the crowd and beginning to speak into people's ears what to do, who to vote for, and who to uh, vote to release. Well, while all this is going on, it says Pilate is like sitting in his official chair where he makes an official decision and somebody sneaks up behind him and gives him a note. Again, this is all in Scripture. Somebody sneaks up, gives him a note. This is in Matthew 27, verse 19. It's from his wife. And here's what his wife says. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, Jesus. For I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Think about that. I mean, his wife had such a surreal, supernatural, I mean, we don't know any details, but experience, vivid dream that she's like, look, I don't want to be associated with messing with this innocent man, Jesus. And I'm going to send word to my husband who is the authority in this situation, right in the middle of the whole scenario. Meanwhile, the Jewish leaders continue to move around the crowd to persuade everyone to request the release of Barabbas and to crucify Jesus. And so they begin to shout. They begin to cry out, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas, set Barabbas free, crucify Jesus. And, and the crowd begins to gain momentum. And, and while all of this is going on, Pilate is still dumbfounded and confused and literally says, why? Why? Again, this is a guy that supposedly doesn't care, 
But we see these moments where it seems like he does. His wife clearly is like, I care enough to tell you, hey, let's get out of this situation. We don't want to be connected to this. So he says to the crowd, why? What crime has he committed? He literally says those words. But the crowd gets louder and louder. Give us Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. And what we see next is evidently the only thing that Pilate could do. Because remember, Pilate is literally in the city so that the city is calm. He's the authoritative figure there that's able to squash any rebellion, any uprising, any drama, because he keeps all these Jews in line for Rome. And he does not want that boat to get upset. And so he sees the crowd has shifted. He thought they were going to go with Jesus, but they've shifted and they're asking for Barabbas. He knows this is all a sham. And so it says in Matthew 27, verse 24, when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water, and imagine this, and he washed his hands in front of the crowd Just imagine him picking up water. It's very symbolic, but he didn't leave it symbolic. He literally washes his hands and he says, I am innocent of this man's blood. And he said, it is your responsibility. Probably the most chilling thing happens next, in my opinion, with this crowd of Jewish religious zealous people of God. They respond. They respond to Pilate's phrase, I'm innocent of this man's blood. It's your responsibility. And they say, we take the responsibility. We want him dead and we want his blood. His blood can be on our heads and on the heads of our children in the future. We want him dead. This is how wound up Caiaphas had gotten a crowd through a fake trial, through all the drama. And so when they responded that way, Pilate, to satisfy the crowd, it says, released Barabbas and ordered that Jesus be flogged. Now, maybe you've heard of a flogging or maybe you've seen a scene from a movie where they like reenacted this. This is a brutal, brutal time for Jesus. The decision has been made. The soldiers take Jesus away. And through all the accounts, we can put this together. The soldiers, in a very mocking way, first strip Jesus naked, and then they flog him. They're whipping him. They're hitting him with a whip that has all kinds of things, uh, you know, embedded in the ends of leather straps that will rip the skin off every time it hits and pulls back. Most people died at this stage just in preparing for the crucifixion of, of, of anybody. They would die right here and they whip Jesus. But not only do they that, uh, whip him, they they get out a a scarlet robe. This is the beginning of the the mockery. Jesus is hanging on for life and they put a a purple robe on him. They they twist a crown of thorns and shove it on his head. They give him a staff. Imagine Jesus being able to barely, you know, stay in in, in consciousness and, and they're dressing him up like a king. They actually, it says in scripture, knelt down before him and they mocked him and said hail king jesus king of the jews and then they each began to spit on him spit on him and then they grabbed the staff that they gave him and it says in scripture that they took that staff and they struck him in the head and to quote scripture again and again and again And as they not only broke him down physically, 
they tried to begin to break him down emotionally. And then they gathered up what was left of Jesus. And they took him to a place where they said, pick up that cross and carry it to your final place where you're going to die. Now, I want you to understand something. Lies, manipulation, every step of the way. This started late at night, went through the middle of the night, and we are now in the next day, right? Friday, started Thursday night, now it's Friday. And Jesus has endured a lot of conversations a lot of accusations, a, a, a lot of, you know, just mockery and abuse. And he is going to die on a cross. But before we get there, and, and, and we're not going to even go there in our time today, this is where we have to pause and stop and ask ourselves the question, these guys had eyes on Jesus in his final moments. Just like Judas did. And last week I said, is there anything we can learn from Judas? And I think there was. Well, is there anything that we can learn from these men who, who just made up a sham trial so that they could execute Jesus? And I'm telling you, the answer is yes. There is something that we can learn. And here's the journey I want to take you through. I want to ask you a few questions about how you view Jesus. Now that you've been given a real historical account and a timeline that maybe you can categorize now all the details, do you view Jesus like any of these men view Jesus? I mean, I know there are a lot of people out there watching right now, and I, I, I know there's a lot of different backgrounds, and, and I'm pretty sure that, that there's some of you that view Jesus like these men view Jesus. So, so let me ask you three questions. Do you view Jesus like Caiaphas? Even Annas and Caiaphas. You say, what do you mean do I view Jesus like Caiaphas? Well, Caiaphas viewed Jesus as a threat to be neutralized, right? I mean, think about it. A threat to be neutralized. These Jewish leaders were about power, authority, and control. And, you know, they were supposed to be people who were in love with God, awaiting a Messiah. But, but I'm pretty sure these guys were more comfortable pretending to be Messiah. They didn't want to find the Messiah. And when he came right in front of them, they rejected him. Why? Because they were more comfortable being the Messiah. They wanted the power. They wanted the control. They wanted the authority. They liked how things were. Remember that map I showed you? They were living in the, in the richest area. They were the experts. Everybody was under their thumb and they did not want that to change. And if this guy was the Messiah, well, they needed to deal with him. But I don't think they wanted to find Jesus as the Messiah or anybody as the Messiah. And that leads to a question for you. Is that how you view Jesus? Have you always looked at Jesus as a threat? Like if, like if you entered into any kind of relationship with Jesus or if you went around any place that talked about Jesus, that, that all of a sudden there would, there would be a, a new authority in your life that would require you to make some changes or to submit. You see, there are some people uh, who view Jesus as a threat to be neutralized and they never see Jesus as a savior. And I just want you to really process through that. These guys missed out on the Messiah because they wanted to be the Messiah. Are you missing out because you're worried about control and power in your own life? Now that's a question only you can answer, but I'm hoping that you will pray through that and process through that and arrive at the place where you understand that you need to find the Savior and you need to recognize that you can't save yourself. The second question I want to ask you is, do you 
view Jesus like Pilate? Do you view Jesus like Pilate? How, how did Pilate view Jesus? Um, I, I, I struggled with figuring out a phrase, but here's what I came up with. A distraction to be ignored. When, when I think about really what Pilate did, think about this. He ignored his own conscience. He ignored his own gut feelings. He couldn't find anything wrong with Jesus, but he ignored that. He ignored good advice from his wife. She says, hey man, we shouldn't have anything to do with this. He's like, uh, and he just kept moving forward. He, he ignored truth, right? Jesus is standing before him. Jesus is truth, right? Jesus is saying, I am the truth. And anybody who believes in truth is on my side. And Pilate goes, uh, you know, what is truth? Trying to minimize truth, kind of taking the position like we talked about last week, where a lot of people like to live in that idea that uh, perception is reality because then they get to believe and think whatever they want. But that's not what is reality. Reality is reality. Truth is truth. It's not your truth and my truth. There's only one truth. But Pilate didn't want to go anywhere near that discussion. So he dismisses the conversation by saying, what is truth? A distraction to be ignored. Is that how you view Jesus? Kind of like Pilate? Pilate thought it was, you know, easier to satisfy the crowd and keep things comfortable for himself rather than deal with Jesus. Well, if you view Jesus this way, I, I just want to warn you and I want to encourage you. You can ignore Jesus now, but you can't ignore him forever. You know, Pilate thought he washed his hands of Jesus, but here's the reality. We're all going to stand before God on judgment day and we won't be able to ignore Jesus then. In fact, it is going to be really crucial that we didn't ignore him while we lived here because on that day, you do not want to stand before the Father on judgment day without Jesus by your side because the only way you get into heaven is for Jesus to stand in front of you and say, yes, he messed up. Yes, she screwed up. Yes, they're liars. Yes, they were unfaithful, but I died for them. And they accepted me, and so my blood covers them. That's the only way any of us get into heaven for eternity is by the grace of Jesus. We need him standing there with us. And if we ignore him now, we will stand alone on judgment day. It's a warning, but it's also an encouragement because Jesus wants to stand with you and he doesn't want to be ignored. And so for whatever reasons you've kind of pushed Jesus off to the side, stop. If there was ever a time for you to reevaluate and you can see that things can turn all upside down really quick in our lives, it would be now. And stop ignoring Jesus and turn to him. The third question centers on Herod. Do you view Jesus like Herod did? You know, Herod viewed Jesus as like a genie in the bottle, right? Like, what can you do for me? Oh, great. You're the miracle worker. Put on a show. Do a magic trick. Make me laugh. Give me what I want. I mean, this is how Herod, I mean, we only get a little glimpse, but I mean, it was a pretty short conversation, clearly because Herod wasn't getting what he wanted. Do you view Jesus this way as, a, as God that will give you whatever you need whenever you want it and you'll come to him at your convenience and you'll demand certain prayers to be answered or certain things to happen in your life and if that doesn't go down, well then boom, you're off in another direction? Is that how you view Jesus? This is a question that only you can answer. Let me tell you what's so dangerous about only focusing on what you want from God. And this is big. The danger is you will miss out on, what, on receiving what God wants for you. 
That's what's so dangerous about this. When all you focus on in terms of a relationship or an encounter with God or Jesus is, is what you want, then you're going to potentially miss out on what they want to give you. And can I tell you, they know what you need more than you know. God the Father, the Creator, and Jesus the Son, they know better what you need than what you think you know, right? And man, Herod never even had a chance because he was so dismissive of Jesus because he didn't get the magic show that he wanted. And maybe God didn't show up the way that you wanted or answer the prayer that you wanted and, and maybe you've ignored him or dismissed him. I don't know what's going on in your life, but, but can I just tell you something? God knows, Jesus knows better than you, what you need. And if you can get to the place where you would trust them, you will experience an unbelievable relationship with the creator of the universe. You know, a perfect example of this comes from the story that I told you today. And as I close, I, I, I'll just remind you, how hard was it for you to listen to me tell you some of the details about what happened to Jesus, right? It was hard. It was hard because we don't like to hear that Jesus was spit on, that he was mocked, that he had his flesh ripped from his body. We don't like that at all. And, and, and I was thinking about it, you know, that so many of us, like we want what we want and we don't understand that we're going to miss out on what God wants for us. Just in that scenario, it may be hard to read those details. You might turn your you know, eyes shut when you're watching the passion when it gets to that scene. Why? Because we don't want Jesus to have to go through that. That's what we want. And if I got to make the rules, he wouldn't have experienced that. But here's the problem. Jesus knew what we needed more. Jesus was silent. All that talk about silent. The reason Jesus was trying, not trying to get out of it was because he was on mission to go to the cross. Jesus wasn't trying to avoid all of the abuse or avoid death. He wanted to face it head on because he knew that's actually what we needed. That we needed the perfect lamb to be slaughtered. And so as it says in the Old Testament, like, like a sheep before the shearer, the silent before the slaughter, Jesus went to the cross because he knew that's exactly what we needed. If it was left up to us, we would have had Jesus skip that some way. I'm thankful it wasn't up to us. I'm thankful that Jesus went to the cross. And even though I don't like the gruesome details, it's what saves me and saves you from hell. And so eyes are on Jesus. I don't know what your eyes have been seeing, but this historical account will hopefully lead you to asking some really important questions because what we're wanting this to lead you to is to view Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You know what happened just a few moments before I started recording in this empty room? we had another person show up to the church to be baptized. I don't even know what the count is now, but I'm telling you every week and every few days throughout this whole situation, there have been those that were so courageous in their decision that they didn't even want to postpone it. And we made all kinds of jokes. They got into the baptistry and we're like, oh, we got we to drain the baptistry and wash it again because of, cause of the virus. And you know what? We'll drain it and we'll refill it time and time again if you come to the conclusion that you're ready to see Jesus for who he is. You call the church, you email one of our pastors, you get on the app, and man, we will be there for you, rain or shine, pandemic or not. God bless you for listening. And let me just pray for you and your family right now. God, thank you so much for our time in your word. Thank you so much for the reminder of what actually happened, the series of events, it's mind-blowing. And I'm just so thankful that your son loved us so much that he was willing to go through all of that. 
And so we just give you praise and honor and glory. Everything that we've done in this service, all of the teams that are working behind the scene, the, the, the worship, the, the, the pieces that have all come together are out of our effort to praise you for what you have done for us, to glorify you, and so that we can be a light for others to see you with the right kind of eyes. We love you, Father. And we just look forward to serving you every day and one day being with you for eternity. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. We'll see you next time.